seems like seven stud because so much of your hand is defined all at once. And we're talking about the flop here. Three cards coming all at once largely determine how good your hand is or how bad it is. We're going to examine the flop. There's dangerous flops, there's relatively safe flops, and then there's the great flops where you flop the hand that's almost unbeatable. So we'll give you illustrations of all of these. Don't expect favorable flops too often. The flop will usually disappoint you. Unlike seven stud, where your hand unfolds one card at a time following the first betting round, in Hold'em, the flop comes three cards all at once and tends to completely define your hand. You need to keep in mind that the flop won't usually make you happy. If you got into a raising war with ace-king suited, all these typical flops will leave you in jeopardy of having to fold. That's the normal outcome for a flop. Whether you hold a small pair, an ace and a high kicker, suited connectors, or two other fairly high cards, that flop isn't usually your friend. You need to live with that reality if you're going to excel at Hold'em. Unless you hold aces, the flop will always threaten to leave you heartbroken. You need to learn to evaluate flops and decide how much they hurt or helped you and how they likely affected your opponents. If you hold then this flop isn't nearly as profitable as this flop. In the first case, you made a pair of aces, but you fear someone else having made a pair of aces with a higher kicker, a queen or a king. But with the second flop, you hold the top pair of jacks with an ace kicker and you're, at least temporarily, in command. Learn to evaluate flops and get yourself in the right hold'em mindset by expecting that the flop you're about to see probably won't be on your wish list. So Mac, what do you think makes a good game? Well, you know, Doyle, I have probably a different perception on this than you do. I really like to go into the games where there's lots of laughter. When people are laughing, having a good time, they're not playing poker seriously. But when people are playing poker seriously, if I see a lot of silence, I'll choose the game where there's noise and laughter over that game anytime. Usually when somebody's laughing, it means they're winning. And if they're silent, it means they're losing. So I think I'll go where they're losing. <laughs> Doyle, if you have a choice of games, what games do you seek to make a profit from? Well, I think I'm probably a little bit unusual in that regard, Mike, because I just seek out the biggest game that I can find because that's usually where that I can win the most money. But that isn't true for everybody. No, Some, I, I say I, I probably have a different perspective. And plus, I'm lucky enough that I can play all the games, you know, mm -hmm. equally well. I, use, I just look for the biggest game I can find. But in the biggest game, you have to hope that some weak players come in at some times, once in a while. Even though you're the best in the world, acknowledged by all, if, if you all only have a small advantage, you'd we'd rather be playing against oh, much weaker players at three quarters of the stake, wouldn't you agree? No, I like the challenge. <laughs> He's a man of challenges. Aggressive players hate to check and fold, but it's something you must learn to do. Remember, whenever you make the right decision in poker, you've earned money, even if it's by folding, and means that profit is deferred until the next hand or the next week. Saving money now just means you'll have more to spend on future pots in more profitable situations. Saving is earning and checking and folding for the right reasons is saving money. Let's say you have this hand and the flop is 
You'll often see opponents check and then call in this situation, mostly in limit hold'em games. Checking is usually right, but calling is wrong. Any time you make the third ranking pair on the board and there are two high ranking overcards, your first instinct should be to run for cover. These are times you'd like to get a free card, so you hope no one bets. But if someone does bet, you've got to abandon this hand. Yes, your pair of jacks might be good. Yes, you might catch a queen to make a straight, which, by the way, could easily then be beaten by a flush or tied. And yes, you might make three jacks or jacks and tens, but this isn't even close to the kind of hand you should call with, limit or no limit. The hand isn't strong enough for a value bet, because if you're called, you'll usually be beat, and it isn't weak enough to warrant a bluff. You're hoping to check and watch your opponent check also. But if you check and an opponent bets, fold check and fold. Here's another hold'em hand you should check and fold. It's no limit. You're in the small blind and have just made a routine raise of the big blind with the big blind calls. The flop looks like this. Although this is a dismal flop for your hand, you might occasionally bet hoping your opponent in the big blind will fold. The problem with that is this. When you raised, you represented at least medium high cards. Your opponent would be more likely to fear you now and fold if there were more higher ranking cards out there. There aren't. So you check. Your opponent bets a little less than the size of the pot. Should you call? You'd be surprised how many lively players call in these situations. They figure, sure, the flop didn't help them, but it probably didn't help their opponent either. That part constitutes good thinking, and with just two players seeing the flop, you should often bet or call without a pair, simply because there's a good chance your opponent didn't like the flop either. But not here. Players make the mistake of calling with this hand because they have two overcards, two cards higher than any card on the flop. Two overcards can sometimes be enough to call with. But not now. When you call on the strength of two overcards, they need to be commanding, like ace-king, ace-queen, or king-queen, not king-ten. Check and fold. Ace-king can constitute two overcards that are high enough to call with, but not if you're against two or more opponents. Suppose you opened in an early position in a 200-400 limit hold'em game with, well, this ace-king, and there are two callers. Now the flop comes. You check, the next player checks, and the third player bets the required $200. Now what? Well, many players, even experienced ones, make the mistake of calling here. You might do that often heads up, but you shouldn't do it against two opponents even though one is checked and might fold. You can't be sure that you'll end up heads up if you call. You can't sell a raise easily because opponents expect you to have big ranking cards in your early position. So you'll either call or fold. But listen, calling is bad doesn't compute in terms of profit. You checked. That was good. Now you fold. That's good too. I'm the mad genius of poker, Mike Carroll. And I'm Doyle Brunson. I amplify. Do you?